Good evening and welcome to the landscapes of the soul. Tonight we're going to uh, investigate and take a look at uh, love. You hear that thrown around so many times and it's almost a Christian thing to do to talk about love, but we've got to dig deeper into the meaning of love so that we can better understand uh, how, why Jesus made it uh, the love commandment. You know, love one another as I have loved you is the one, the one rule that Jesus gave us. So I want to begin with a quote from David Benner's book, uh, Surrender to Love. Love is the strongest force in the universe. Gravity may hold planets in orbit and nuclear forces may hold the atom together, but only love has the power to transform a person. Only love can soften a hard heart. Only love can renew trust after it has been shattered. Only love can inspire acts of genuine self-sacrifice and only love can free us from the tyranny effects of fear. Love is like grace. It is received, not achieved. Love, love is received and not achieved. So let's explore that a little bit. We know from the creation story that God created humanity in God's image as male and female created him male and female. We are a reflection of God's image in us. Now, what is God's image in us? It is simply this, to become a beloved child of God. You are beloved. You are beloved of God. But sometimes we forget that essential reality, and that's what I want to look at tonight with you, the Imago Dei. So think about a tree as in Psalm 1, be like a tree planted by the streams and in its season it shall bear fruit. So you have this idea of a tree by the streams. The streams of water is the spirit, which is love, God's love flowing and the tree has roots. The roots go deep into the ground. And when the water is touching the roots, uh, the, the flow of the water through the roots, through its stem and into its branches and leaves so that it will bear fruit. So the essential reality is this, that you are rooted as beloved of God. That is the essential reality. You are a beloved of God. The stem then is like your personality and through your personality, the beloved image of God, the beloved child uh, flows into the leaves so that it bears fruit in our character. We often mistake our personality for the essential reality. It is not. It is the essential reality is where we are rooted. We are rooted in the beloved, as a beloved child of God, which receives its source from the living waters that flow into the roots, through the stem, through your personality, into the, the branches and leaves to bear fruit and develop your character. One of the problems that we have with change is that we're trying to change the personality. Uh, the personality is a reflection of both nurture and nature. Part of it is genetic, part of it is the way we've been raised, but the rootedness behind that stem, behind that personality, when it's rooted in the beloved love of God, the beloved child of God, then it finds its way to heal the, the personality so that it's expressing in a unique way the fruits and the character of God. That's your personality, your uniqueness. But if we ground ourselves in our personality alone, there are three things that will happen. 
when we are grounded in our personality and not rooted in the beloved child of God. And that is, uh, we, we, we believe that, well, let me put it this way. I am what I have. I am what I have. So if I don't have what I want, then I feel unworthy. I feel like a loser or I feel uh, wounded because we've equated our identity with what I have. Our identity, so listen very carefully, our identity is rooted in the image of God. It is rooted in being a beloved child of God. We are beloved children of God. And when we are rooted in that, then the lies and the falsehood begins to uh, heal in our personality. So these three lies, one, I am what I have, I am what I do, and I am what other people say and think about me. When we are uh, sort of in our stem, our, our personality, we thrive on I am what I have. I am what other people think of me. I am uh, what I do. We thrive and, and eventually uh, that will come, that won't fulfill us. That's not what fulfills us. That's not what gives us joy. That's not what flourishes us. It is to know that we are rooted, our identity is not rooted in those things, but our identity is rooted in the image of God. You are a beloved child of God. Once you understand that you are rooted in the image of God, then love begins to make sense. Then, then all of a sudden, uh, what Jesus said, uh, I give you a new commandment that you love one another, not as the world has loved you, but as I have loved you, because I am rooted in the beloved, being a beloved child of God. How do I know that? Well, let's look at scripture. Immediately coming out of the water, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him and a voice out of heaven, the voice out of him, the voice of God says this, you are my beloved son and I am pleased in you. Now just think about that for a moment. So Jesus grew up we don't know much about his life between the time he was 12 and 33. His ministry begins when John the Baptist is uh, put in prison. And so this, he goes to John the Baptist, he's baptized, the Spirit comes upon him, and God says, you are my, my beloved son, I am pleasing you. But Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't started his ministry. He didn't proclaim the gospel. He didn't do, he, he was simply being a child of God. Not what he does, not what he has, and not what other people think of him. He is simply the Son of God, as you and I are called to be children of God, sons and daughters. It's as though God were opening up the heavens and saying to you, in your particular situation, saying to you, you are my son you are my daughter and I am pleased in, with you. There isn't anything that you could do to make me love you more and there isn't anything that you can do to make me love you less. You are a beloved child of God. And when you are rooted, when your identity is rooted in the beloved child of God and that sense of being loved by God, for who you are, being loved by God, it is pleasing to God. When you are rooted, your identity is rooted in that you can face anything. You can face anything. You can, your personality will, will be distinctive, but it isn't defining who you are. Your personality does not define who you are. It's your rootedness in the image of God. That is your identity, who you are, in Christ, when, you, when we say in Christ, we are saying you are beloved of God. And when we understand that we are rooted in God's image, that we are beloved, we can't help but to begin to love other people 
and to see other people as God sees them because God doesn't see them for what they do. God doesn't love humanity more for what it does and not less for what it doesn't do. God's love is constant and always the same. It is the most misunderstood Christian principle, I think, uh, today, because we talk about love, but we really don't know we really don't know what that means. So Mark, just like Mark, uh, we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit, and we are our identity is rooted in the image of God, which finds its expression through our personality, the stem of the tree, and then it brand, and the branches and the leaves our fruit in the character. Now, listen to this. The tree does not bear fruit for itself. The tree bears fruit for others. So that when our identity, when we are rooted in our identity as a, as a beloved child of God, and our the Spirit is moving through our unique personality, and we begin to flourish with fruits and character, it's not for us. Remember what Scripture says? Scripture says, uh, it doesn't say that God loved us because we love God. It just simply says that God first loved us. Period. For God so loved the world. Period. So we are we are rooted, our identity is rooted in the image of God. And that is received, not achieved. Jesus went into the world, he came into the world, and the world was made through him. But the world didn't know him, didn't recognize him. He came to his own, and his own didn't recognize him, and they didn't receive him. But as many as would receive Christ, to them he gave the right or the authority or the power to become a beloved child of God. It's grace. It is received. It is not achieved. Your standing with God cannot be achieved. It is simply received. It is embraced. You are a beloved child of God, rooted in his image. And when we are rooted, in, our identity is rooted in God's image, then we can begin to understand what it means to love, to fulfill the love commandment, to love one another, to love other people, to love the enemy, to love those who are not loving, to love those who criticize us, to love those who judge. We begin to understand that it's not dependent on our personality, but rather it is rooted in our identity, and our identity is in the Imago Dei. The heavens open up, and a voice comes and said, Oh, my beloved child of God, in you I am well pleased. And this is the new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples. It doesn't say you'll know that you are my Christians. It says you, they will know that you are my disciples. What will they know? They know because we love one another and we're loving others in a way that is consistent with our identity that's rooted in the Imago Dei, the image of God. There is no fear in love. When our identity is rooted as beloved child of God. That is perfect love that casts out all fear. There is no fear in love, says John, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. In other words, if you're trying to give love, be love through your personality, it just doesn't work because you're trying to achieve something, you're working at something. Rather, you receive the notion that your identity is rooted. When you are open to that, when you embrace that, when you accept that, when you receive that, your life will then be transformed. There is no fear in love. And by the way, a lot of people think that the opposite of love is hate. It's really not. The opposite 
uh, or or the corollary to hate is is fear. Fear is what induces hatred. Fear of something. Fear of someone else. Fear of whatever it might be. That's what that's what causes hate to happen. And perfect love casts out fear. And when fear is cast out, then you are free and liberated to love that which is different, to love that which is other than yourself, to to broaden your horizons, your parameters of love for other people, because you are rooted in the notion of God's image for you. Now, next week, I am going to uh, talk about, in more depth, the four loves, the four Greek words that are in Scripture that describe what love is. And we have to look at these each carefully. And next week, I will, I will look at them more carefully. But tonight, I want to lay it out for you so that you you uh, begin to understand. So when we talk about divine love, or when we talk about God's love, many, many people think that agape, the Greek word agape, is divine love. It's not. So listen carefully. Divine love, God's love, is all four. All four have to be integrated into wholeness and well-being. So we're going to look at all four as divine love, not one as human love, one as God's love. All four comprise and make up what's God's love. All four is the rootedness, our identity rooted in the beloved. So when we understand these four versions of love in the Greek, then we begin to get insight as to what it means, what God's image is, and what it means that our identity is in being a beloved child of God. So I'm going to give you the Greek words, and, and, and again, I'll go over this more carefully with you next week. But the first one is storge. That's a Greek word. It, it's translated love. But the meaning of storge has something to do with bond, bondedness, family relations. It, it doesn't necessarily mean bond by uh, blood relations, because that's what the metaphor, see the metaphor of Jesus uh, blood, when, we, when you take Holy Communion, for example, we say this is the blood of Christ. It's not to be taken literally. That is saying we are bonded to God and to one another. And guess what the bonding is? The bonding is empathy. Let me say that again. Bonding is empathy. That's what bonds us together. So when we experience uh, a storge love, it means we are bonding one to another through the blood of Christ, through our families, through a, a strong and deep connection that we might have with another person. We are bonded through empathy. We are also bonded by empathy to those that we may not even know. That's, that's that bonding, so that idea of empathy and bonding a story game. Then there's phileo, you know, phileo, Philadelphia, the, uh, the city of uh, brotherly love. Uh, so phileo has something to do with friendship. It's translated friendship, friendship. But friends are not made. Friends are discovered. So we'll talk more about that uh, at, uh, in next week. And then there's eros, which is probably the most misunderstood uh, Greek word because we get erotica. We think it's, oh, it must be lust, it must be sin. Must, no, it doesn't mean any of those things. It could when the personality is stuck on itself and not rooted in the identity of beloved, it could go haywire, but what it really means is that you have passion for life. You got fire in your belly. You have passion for other people. You have passion for justice. You have passion for, it's passion to be, to that eros love. God has passion for you. God is in love with you. Uh, that's why he calls you beloved child of God. So eros is nothing to be afraid of. It needs to be rooted in our identity, connected to the image of God in us. And then finally, there is a, a agape or a agape. Some people pronounce it that way. It simply means unconditional love. And what unconditional love means is justice. It is to treat every human being with justice. It is to see every situation through the lenses of, of the lens of justice and peace. So it is an action. So agape is an action verb. It is the it is the action. Love is an action verb in which we treat every person with dignity and respect because they are a reflection of God's image. 
Those are the four words. We'll take a closer look at those words next week and we'll deal with them uh, more. But until uh, next week, I hope you can embrace. I hope you can surrender yourself. Surrender yourself to, to God's love. To surrender yourself and hear the word of God speak to you. You are my beloved child and I am well pleased in you. So from my heart until your heart, to, to your heart, from my heart to your heart, until we meet again next week, God's peace and blessings and God's love surround you and may you be rooted, may your identity be rooted in beloved child of God. Amen.